Today we have a speaker named Andrew, Dr. Andrew Howitt from Cal State University Fullerton. He teaches philosophy and he's going to talk about the crisis of public reason. I think it's about how we deal with differences within groups, which is sort of a timely topic. So, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you to all of you. I'm very grateful that this kind of community exists. Um, I think this is a very important time for us to have a community like this one, uh, for reasons that will become obvious. I feel like we look back at this picture, by the way, and it's like, wow, those actually were the good old days of public debate. Uh, I didn't realize that at the time. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about the ethics of public discourse, or perhaps the lack thereof, uh, chronic lack thereof that exists right now. Um, my job is as a philosophy professor, uh, that's a lot less grandiose and exciting than it sounds. Mostly what I do, rather than think about the meaning of life, which I get to do very occasionally, is <laughs> I teach your kids or your friends' kids um, how to think critically, how to argue logically and persuasively, and ideally how to disagree respectfully. Uh, I have come to believe, uh, as a result of the primary season and as a result of my own biases, that this is one of the most important jobs in America right now. Um, but yes, as I say, I'm very biased. Um, so what we teach uh, is argument, uh, philosophers. Now, by that, we don't mean yelling at one another. Uh, what we mean by argument is com really comes has its roots in, in Aristotle and in ancient Greece. So Aristotle famously observed that human beings are... Uh, political creatures. And by that, he didn't mean that we all deserve a role in House of Cards, right? He means that we are social creatures that depend on one another for various things. And one of the things that we depend on one another for is our knowledge of the world, right? We tell one another things. Your teachers tell you things. Your parents tell you things. Uh, we depend on one another in all kinds of ways. Um, as a result of being dependent and enjoying forming communities like this one and families and couples, we encounter disagreement and we have to come up with some kind of response to agreements. Uh, some of these responses that we come up with are what you might call rational and some of them are most definitely not. So the rational response to agreement is argument, that is to have a discussion or a debate to say here's what I think and why and then you say what you think and why and then we have some kind of process unfold. Um, it's the rational response to disagreement because it actually gets us closer to our goal, which is to live peacefully and successfully together. Irrational responses, of course, would be yelling at one another, which does not get us closer to our goal. Violence, right? All the very, very many things that we've seen in many of the primary debates, right? Name calling, um, ad hominems, those kinds of things. Um, this consists of really two aspects. There's kind of a, the external aspect I'm talking about. Argument is about reaching out to other people, uh, trying to understand their views, uh, trying to decide what you think about their views. But it's also an internal process, right? It's about figuring out what you personally believe and trying to reason your way to the truth about various matters. Okay, which brings us to the question, why is there so little of this on display in contemporary political culture? Um, in contemporary American culture. Why is it that when we watch the primary debates, we don't see people doing this? What we see is people doing the irrational thing, the name calling and all the rest of it. Well, I'm here to try to give you a good positive message today about this unfortunate situation. And the positive message is we understand better than we ever have before what's going wrong. And as a result of that, I am optimistic that we may, in decades to come, be able to do something about it. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we think is causing it and therefore what some suggestions might be for ameliorating the situation. Uh, just as an example of why to be optimistic, a colleague of mine, Michael P. Lynch, who works in Connecticut, was just received a grant of $5.75 million from the Templeton Foundation to research improving the ethics of public discourse. So people are taking this stuff pretty seriously. And there's a lot of different researchers from a lot of different places uh, disciplines, not just philosophy, coming together to understand this. All right, so there are lots of political reasons for the current situation in the States. I'm not, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to talk to you about those. Many of you know them very well. But what is it that's so problematic from a logical point of view? I think basically there are three things. The first is the sheer intensity of people's emotions. That is emotions like anger, betrayal, disappointment, frustration. When people are emotional, they don't reason well. We all know this. We know this about ourselves. Second, 
There's the connection between those emotions and the identities that we have. That is the groups that we think of ourselves as belonging to. Think about the amount of emphasis that there's been this primary season on the wings of the party, that is the libertarian wing of the Republican Party versus the establishment wing. These are identities and they are connected very strongly to the kinds of emotions, emotional responses that we have when a candidate says things. And the third thing is our contemporary modes of public discourse. This includes in particular social media and what I now call news, because it's not news anymore most of the time, it's entertainment. Uh, actual news is relatively hard to find. If any of you still watch the PBS News Hour, good for you. It's one of the only news shows still on television, as far as I can tell. These three things, I think, coalesce to produce some very unfortunate phenomena, the primary one of which is group polarization. This is the phenomenon where people, if they hang out with other people who agree with them, over time their views will become more extreme. That's not a partisan thing that happens on both sides. And as a consequence of social media, which allows you to filter the content that you see so that you're only seeing things that you agree with. If you do that, your views are likely to get more extreme over time. That's unfortunate. All these things, I think, confound our ability to reason well. Okay. So the obvious solution to this problem, and the, the one you'll hear most people talk about most of the time, is what you might call the, the more information or better education hypothesis. It says, we just need a better educated, better informed electorate. Now, you would expect me to be a big fan of this hypothesis, and actually, in a sense, I am, but in a sense, I'm not. I think it's much too simplistic. Because actually, let's be optimistic about it. Let's recognize the facts. People are better educated than they have been before. They do have access to way more information than they've ever had before, courtesy of the internet. It's not as simple as this, right? Intelligence, critical thinking skills, information, they do play a role in the crisis, but not the role that you might expect. Smarter people are not actually likelier to avoid errors in reasoning. In fact, in many cases, they are more likely to make certain kinds of errors. So let me try to convince you of this by citing one very quick recent study by Dan Cahan and his colleagues at Yale. Cahan and his colleagues devised a reasoning test and what they did was they picked uh, a topic that nobody had any particularly strong emotions about. Uh, it was a case where they were presented with these data about a new treatment for rashes. Okay? So here we have the number of patients who did use the cream whose rash got better or whose rash got worse. Then the patients who didn't use the cream whose rash got better or whose rash got worse. And the participants in the study were asked please indicate whether the experiment shows that using the new cream is likely to make the skin condition better or worse. Now, I'm not going to make you feel bad by trying to answer this, because 59% of people get it wrong. And that's because we, when we reason about these kinds of problems, we tend to rely on shortcuts, and these shortcuts are systematically problematic. Uh, I'll just tell you the answer. The answer is that it's more likely to make it worse, uh, because if you calculate the ratios, that's what you were supposed to be doing mathematically, you'll find that a quarter of people who did use the cream it got worse, whereas only 16% of people who didn't did it get worse. Okay, so far this is not particularly interesting or surprising. That is, people get it right when they're good at math. Um, right? The people who had better math skills got the problem right. People who didn't have great math skills like me get the problem wrong. Right? So far, not so interesting or surprising. What comes interesting or surprising is when you do the same study again with a political slant, right? Get those emotions going and we see what happens. So we use exactly the same statistics, but we switch the topic from the skin cream to gun control, okay? So exactly the same numbers, exactly the same matrix, exactly the same reasoning required, right? But you can already anticipate how this is going to go, right? It's not going to go well. But it's going to go badly in really interesting ways. <laughs> so the results of this study, right, so the, the ratios would be the same. And by the way, these aren't real statistics. They're just made up. And there was a version of this that, that kind of supported the gun control and a version of this that went against the gun control, and they were tested on various people. It prompted a, a, a writer you may know, Ezra Klein, to write a very wonderful piece in Vo on Vox.com called How Politics Makes Us Stupid, right? And in it, he says the following. Liberals are extremely good at solving the problem when doing so proved that gun control legislation reduced crime. But when presented with a version of the problem that suggested gun control had failed, their math skills stopped mattering. They tended to get the problem wrong no matter how they could, could wear a math. 
conservatives exhibited the same pattern, just in reverse. That's pretty crazy and slightly unfortunate, but it gets worse, believe it or not. Uh, oh, we skipped one. Oh, my slide is gone. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so in the next slide, what it would have told you is that it turns out that not only do both sides get this wrong, but that how good you are at math actually makes how likely you are to get it wrong worse. That is, people who are really good at math are going to get the problem wrong more often if it, fits their, if it doesn't fit their ideological position. Right? So this is a case where being better at math, having more skills at reasoning, actually makes you more likely to get the answer wrong if the answer conflicts with what you believe, if it conflicts with your identity and with the emotions that are associated with that identity. Right? So better educated, more skills, not the whole solution. Right? It's got to be something a little bit better than that. We have to think slightly differently about what educating people to fix this problem is going to look like. Here are some suggestions. These are pretty schematic, and I'm leaving a lot of things out. I think we need to focus absolutely on education, absolutely on information and skills. They do matter. They matter because when people are cool-headed, they do get the answer right more often when they've got the skills. But what we need is for them to be cool-headed in the first place. right? That is, we all need to learn how to create the conditions in which people are actually receptive to reasoning, are actually good at reasoning. And that's something we spend almost no time learning how to do. I, as an educator, haven't been trained in how to do that. And yet, when I run my classroom, that's exactly what I'm doing, is creating the conditions for my students to reason with a cool head about things that they might be very politi are politically sensitive, right? They might be very emotionally charged. So how do we do that, right? How do we live better and help often in connection with this, with this problem, right? Well, here are some suggestions. Uh, again, this is early days yet. Yeah, I'm hoping my research in, in future years will solidify this. The first thing is, when people feel like you're trying to persuade them, they tend to get defensive. So a good solution is stop trying to persuade people. If you find that you have a political disagreement with someone, don't try and convince them they're wrong. Instead, try to understand why they think that. Right? Emphasize that what you're, all you're trying to do is, I'm trying to understand your position. Why do you think that? Why aren't you worried about this issue, which seems like an issue to me? Genuinely be interested in the other person. And they're way more likely to be persuasive in my, in persuasive in my experience. A second thing, which we as philosophers really emphasize, but a lot of other people don't, is that when we argue with each other, we see that as an, a marker of respect and care. That is, I care about what you think. That's why I'm arguing with you. If I didn't care what you thought, I wouldn't be arguing with you. right? It also shows that I respect you, because if I didn't respect you, again, either I wouldn't argue with you or I would just call you names instead of trying to offer you reasons. It's because I have respect for your intellectual capacities that I'm saying, let's talk about the reasons for and against this thing. This is a wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis, that humility isn't uh, thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And that, I think, is really important in political argument, because when we have a political argument, we think it's about you and me. Right? We think that someone disagreeing with me is a criticism of me as a person because my beliefs are tied to my identity. If you can separate those two things and say, no, this isn't about me, this isn't about you, this is about what's true, and that's independent of me and you, that, I think, could help to diffuse, to some extent, these problems. There's a great Dan Cohen TED Talk on argument in which he makes the nice following nice observation. You know, shouldn't the winner of the argument be the person who learns something? Right? We normally think that the winner is the person who ends up saying, yeah, he was right all along. Well, that person hasn't learned anything, so I feel bad for that person. Right? <laughs> okay, so to wonder more, if you're interested in, in learning a little more about these topics, there's some really, so much really great work being done on these topics right now by people like Jonathan Haidt. Uh, that's the more cynical, pessimistic perspective, just to let you know. The more optimistic perspective, Michael P. Lynch, who just got that huge grant. Uh, Carl Tavris, Scott Aiken, and that should say Robert Tallis. I don't know if I got that wrong or somehow that got changed. Uh, and Cass Sunstein, who, whose book, uh, Work on Groupthink, talks a lot about group polarization and, and how we fix that. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be thinking about these issues. Now, ordinarily, when I was giving a talk like this, I would want to stop for questions and discussion because I'm a philosopher, so that's kind of what we do. But I don't think that's part of your format. So 
I let me emphasize, I'll be around at the end if you'd like to come talk to me about this stuff. Uh, I, I obviously thoroughly enjoy it, so feel free to come talk to me about it. Um, but just to, to, to close and, and <laughs> let me observe that although this is very funny, right? So it says, anger management therapy, Republicans to the right, <laughs> Democrats to the left, right? <laughs> Although this is very funny, I think this is exactly the problem, right? Is that on the one hand, we do need some anger management therapy, but we don't need to be doing it separately because that's going to make the whole problem worse. All right? Thank you very much for your time. This overlaps a lot with research in psychology, and I've, I've come across a podcast of something like uh, "You Are Not So Smart" or whatever. Right. The guy who wrote those books. Yeah. I'm just sort of curious. What, what do you think of the psychology side of things in, in your work? Uh, so a lot of this in, is inspired by the work of Jonathan Haidt, who also works with Pete Ditto, who's at UCI here in the psychology department. And they've developed a, a whole psychological theory about uh, moral judgment. It's called social intuitionism. And what it says is that when people reason, what they're doing is actually they have an intuition. That is, they think about gun control, or they think about abortion, and they just have a very powerful feeling. And then what happens is they try to rationalize that feeling. So they come up with any reasons they can come up with to show that that feeling is the right feeling to have. Now, the, the worry about that, that, that is then produced by that is that we're not actually reasoning, we're rationalizing, right? Um, now, I think that Haidt's argument for that is a bit overstated. Uh, I think that there is evidence that people do reason. Um, unfortunately, though, the evidence is that we do it a lot less than we think that we do. And that it may well be that the majority of the time, particularly in the realm of politics, we're not reasoning at all. We're just rationalizing. Right. Yeah. Even, even, even the shortcuts, it's not just that we're using heuristics that sometimes misfire. It's that... Um, we're simply picking whatever we can come up with that will show that we're right. We're just not interested in the right answer, right? Yeah. Um, some of what you described seems based on the presumption that there is, in fact, a, a root fact to sure. agree on. Right. Um, whereas, of course, we have many unanswered questions. Of course. And knowing reading the statistics correctly can at least keep us from going down right. blind trails and things, but there's still a g disagreements on the role of hierarchy, right. uh, things like that. I mean, Absolutely. one way to avoid disagreement is to have a strict hierarchy. Right, yeah. But, so there's a... Yeah, I th that's a great point. So Michael Lynch makes a really interesting point about how one of the things that, one of the reasons why there's such a deep crisis right now is it's not just that we can't agree on um, what we should do about the facts. It's that we can't agree on the facts at all. So take climate change as a good example. Ordinarily, you would take some climate change as something like a it's, a, it's a public policy problem. We have to figure out what's the best solution, what should we do? But that's not what our legislators are arguing about. They're arguing about whether it exists. Um, and when you have that deep of a disagreement, we don't just disagree about how to solve the problems, we disagree about what the problems are, and how you figure out what the problems are, that's why there's such a deep crisis right now. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah. Is there a deep crisis right now? Why do we think that? Why do we think that? Um, great question. I think that goes to the question of like, why are people so mad? Why are people so frustrated with the political so process? Why, like, why do people think that we're mad or frustrated or things are worse than they were four, eight, or 12, or 20, or 50 years ago? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's definitely periods in history when uh, Congress, the political process, has been extremely problematic and slow. But if you look at the number of, sheer number of things like government shutdowns, right, uh, the sheer number of symbolic votes, right, votes that don't actually lead to legislation but are simply passed to send a message, those kinds of things are at all-time highs. Uh, there's also, I think, for most people, the biggest sign is the level of demagoguery that's happening in the primary process right now. That is the sheer level of bald-faced lying that is coming out of many candidates' mouths. It's something we haven't seen in many generations. Yeah. I know there's an issue with anonymous postings on 
the internet yeah. that intermediated communication. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's the level of discourse has gotten worse in non-intermediated communication? Can you summarize the question, please? <coughs> Uh, yes, yeah. so the question is, uh, we understand that there's a problem where people are much worse behaved when they're anonymous. And then your question is, is there, any, uh, is there evidence that people's behavior is worse when they're not anonymous? Is that the question? Yes. Hmm. I'm not aware of any evidence on that. Um, I think that that's another thing that goes back to the previous question about it's just us observing the, the kind of tenor of public debate that we see on television or in our living rooms or wherever it might be and feeling like, oh, this is nasty in a way that we maybe haven't seen uh, at least for some time. But that I, I don't, I, in short, I don't know, right? And the importance of humility, um, right? And Socrates says, wisest is he who knows he knows nothing. I don't know the answer to your question and I wish more politicians felt comfortable answering questions that way. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not an expert on everything. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? One more question. Me? Okay. Uh, can you give me an example of a person being rational and a person being reasonable? Uh, so what's behind your question is the assumption that there's a difference? Yes. Is there any difference? And if so, can you explain? Ooh. That's a hard question. <laughs> well, you, you said before... Uh, some people are being rational, but not reasonable, and we don't use our reason. Oh, so the distinction I talked about earlier was the difference between reasoning and rationalizing, right? And the difference is reasoning is where I start out not knowing the answer to a question, wanting to solve a problem but not knowing how. And so what I do is I use my cognitive abilities to find out information and then synthesize the information, do what a scientist would do, basically, right? Have a hypothesis, test the hypothesis. A rationalizer is someone who already knows what it is that they believe and is simply trying to come up with reasons post hoc to, to justify what it is, right? So a good, great example of this, Haidt uses this example of um, you do something wrong or you fail to do something like take out the trash. And somebody says to you, well, you, know, you didn't take out the trash and they get kind of annoyed with you. And so you start coming up with reasons why you didn't take out the trash. Now you're just making those up, right? You're just thinking of anything you could say. Uh, those weren't actually the reasons. You just cooked them up afterwards to justify what you did, right? And the Heights worry and many people's worry is we're rationalizing a lot of the time when it feels to us as though we're reasoning. Thank you very much.